I'm going to just give it um, about four minutes since we're right before three to see if the other two participants log on, okay? Vicki, do you want me to give you a microphone right so you can ask me a question? Okay, so um, I'll probably repeat myself on this, but I'm going to go through the presentation and then we'll try and save um, any questions until the end. And if you want microphone rights at that time, I can give you them. Otherwise, we can write back and forth via chat, the chat box. And um, if you have something pressing, though, during the talk, please do write in the chat box so I can either answer your question within the talk or, or stop and, and give you um, microphone rights. How does that sound? Okay, perfect. Oh, good. You have the ability to make sound or not yourself, too, so that's great. And you can you can hear me okay? The sound is clear. It looks like Sandra is on. Sandra, can you hear me? Good. I know that the name comes up as Marlene Sotelo, but I'm Erin Lozot. I'll introduce myself in just a second. I don't know. Sandra, are you able to hear me? Hmm. So we're just missing one person. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because you are here on time. So I want to make sure that we um, keep to our time to respect you and, and to get everything done in, in the time frame that we have allotted. My name is Erin Brooker Lozot and I am a speech language pathologist by trade, but the assistant director of clinical services at the ELS for Autism Foundation, ELS Center of Excellence. So thank you for being here with me. Um, today we're gonna go over communication and autism spectrum disorder. And again, if you have something pressing and you wanna chat or ask during the talk, please feel free to do so. Um, if you, if not, and you feel like it's something that can wait, I'll definitely allow for some time um, at the end of the talk. So today we're going to really learn about communication within the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And then after the presentation, we can have some nice conversation about uh, communication ASD, any, any experiences you may have that maybe I didn't get to. Um, just for the purpose, since we have such a small group, what are the age ranges of students that you're currently working with? If you could write in the chat box to let me know. Okay, perfect. So some of these examples to begin with, Vicki, are going to be um, probably towards the younger age, and then we're going to go across the age ranges because I think that it's really important to look at the development of communication. In, in general and then look at it specific to autism to be able to uh, have a discussion about in older individuals with communication deficits. 
Um, so to start kind of looking at the two pictures that you see on the screen in front of you, I think it's really important to think about the different messages that are being sent without even words. So you don't know this child, you don't really know the situation or the story that goes along with it, but you could imagine if you look at the little girl in, in the picture to my left, um, she's kind of reaching out towards the ocean and her eyes are wide open and her mouth is just kind of like almost sending a message like, hey, look, look at that. As she, it almost appears as though she's probably trying to tell somebody something, make a comment, not necessarily request something, but really just send a very clear message by coordinating eye gaze with kind of a big facial expression, some nice, what we call shared positive affect and this beautiful reach. In the second picture next to it, you can see that her expression is completely different and there's probably a message of frustration or some sort of negative experience or maybe she's really trying to reach for something specific versus share kind of a social experience or more so make a comment in the, in the first picture. This may be like, I don't want this anymore or give this to me right now type of request. Understanding that the majority of communication really occurs well before words develop and that our gestures and our facial expressions and really the coordination of those, what we call communicative acts is going to, um, hey, Shawnee, I see you. Oh, I have some new members, so welcome everybody. Um, is really going to be what makes our messages so meaningful. I mean, even in this talk, if you had to really think about what is making the difference in, in how much information you're intaking, how much is really, the message, how much of the message I'm sending is words and how much of the message am I sending is maybe the visuals that I'm using or the gestures that I'm using in the talk. It, it really is the majority of our messages being sent are not necessarily the words that we use, but how we combine these kind of gestures and eye gaze um, and vocalizations, if you will, to make our messages clear to the, the communication partner or the receiver. So, what we're going to do is kind of have that and, and think about that as the focus of our talk today to really understand that our communication partner and is going to be an important part of um, every communication interaction, that communication is not a one-way street. It's not just language. It's something that happens between two people. So as we move on, we're going to start, as I said at the beginning, by really talking about what we call normative social development. And that really babies come into the world pre-wired for social engagement. From the first days of life, infants are really profoundly sociable. The human face, face and the voice are, are really the most interesting things that babies pay attention to from those first days of life. So if you can imagine, a baby comes into the world and a baby is automatically almost pre-wired to pay attention to somebody's face, to pay attention to somebody's eyes, to listen and the voice and all of these things are processed in that baby's brain as social information. This then allows for this early kind of development or emergent of what we call selective attention, of social engagement, of these beginning back and forth interactions that a baby probably has with a caregiver to develop then attachments, emotional and social attachments with people. And then that gives you the foundation for social communication skills to really start to unfold, to come online and, and to advance. When you have social communication skills, you can start to develop some, establish really, and then maintain, develop these really nice relationships. So this graph on the slide is important. Don't worry about it, Shawnee. You're, you're not late, you're right on time. I, I'm just appreciative, sorry to interrupt guys, but we have a guest from all the way across the world. So. Her time frame is very different here. Um, looking at this graph though, you see you have these communication milestones in the middle kind of oval, and then you have early social engagement, early understanding of language, your gesture use and sound development. And I think the most important thing to remember here are these things really develop together, infancy through toddler, but they don't necessarily develop one skill after another um, in this kind of linear fashion. And so when we're thinking later on of some of the individuals with autism spectrum that we can hear, and we often teach one skill, then another skill, and we don't teach the next skill until that individual with autism has really developed a whole new set of skills, we always have to remember how does language and communication actually develop? And language and communication develop kind of together 
and they develop multiple layers on one on top of each other. So thinking about how we teach, especially to our older students, and then what, how, how that language would naturally develop in a child that maybe didn't have autism is going to be important to think about as we move on through this talk. Okay. So sticking with our kind of nonverbal communication in the early development, we know what happens in kind of that, that I guess, trajectory that is considered typical. We want to look at then that typical development to those early red flags that we see in autism. And so what we see in the development that maybe children don't go on to be later diagnosed with autism is we see this kind of really nice eye gaze and really gaze shifting. So not sustained eye gaze, but really this, uh, this concept of, okay, I'm looking at mom or I'm looking at dad or caregiver. And then if mom looks away, I'm going to follow where she looks and then come back. So my eyes are really going like this to start to be an observational learner and, and to pay attention to what things may be important and meaningful to me as a little guy or a little girl and what things maybe aren't as important. Whereas what we see in our in the earliest signs of an autism spectrum disorder is sometimes we have more gaze aversion. So maybe if someone's looking straight at me and wanting to have that kind of gaze to face, I may look away or gaze, have this gaze aversion as we call it. This response to name, this is one of the first things that many families will say, my child's not responding to their names. And oftentimes we hear that, um, Maybe they're not hearing. Maybe there's kind of an, you know, I, I don't I don't hear sounds. I don't hear language. I need to have my hearing checked. But then the, hear, the child's hearing may come out within normal um, limits. And then we're saying, well, why? Why isn't my child responding to his name? But he hears or she hears maybe the airplane that just left from, you know, the airport that's very far away from my house or the train or a TV on the other side of the house that happens to have a cartoon or a TV show with a significant sound. And what we know now is that we know that speech and, and names, all of these components are really processed in the, this baby's brain as being social. And if I'm not processing speech and this type of social language in the part of my brain that's supposed to process social information, then it may not seem relevant for me to pay attention to that. What's going to be really rewarding to my brain and meaningful and relevant are going to be those things that make my brain light up. And those are going to be more things like objects or toys or, or those trains or the airplanes that really made a difference, made my brain say, wow, I should pay attention to this. So in our early red flags of autism, we may see lack of response to name. Speech, again, is social, so I may not know that that's relevant to process and pay attention to, so I may have a limited response to adult speech. We also see pointing, and this is one that I really want to highlight and focus today, because pointing, although it seems so, so simple, is so important. Think about it. When you're pointing, and you're not necessarily pointing to touch or to label something in a picture, but you're pointing to show somebody, you're really having to direct what somebody is paying attention to, shift their attention to something else. You almost have to know already that that person is not necessarily paying attention to the same thing that you are, right? So if you have the ability to point, to, to direct someone's attention, then you have the ability to have somebody have a shared focus with you and to make a comment or go on to request. You also have the ability to understand later on that somebody maybe has a different perspective to you. So pointing is really telling us, I'm paying attention enough to people to know that that person has a different thought process than I do, to know that that person may not be on my same kind of wavelength or mainframe. And if I wanna get their attention, I need to shift their attention with this point to then share that experience to make my comment, to have what's called joint attention, which we know is a core deficit in autism. And with that, if I can do that, then that means I'm prepared. I have a foundational skill, a pivotal skill to understand perspective taking and what we call kind of theory of mind, that I know that my words and actions can impact your, your thoughts and your emotional states later on. And this is one of the most difficult things to teach and it's one of the most difficult things for our, our students with autism that really is at the core of, of having autism and, and some of their uh, challenges. 
So then we move on to have kind of that, I don't have as much positive affect sharing because maybe what I'm paying attention to more so what's making my brain really happy is objects and things that I process as non-social um, you know, entities in my brain. And then moving on, if I'm not paying attention to people and really to the, to the face of a person and the eyes and the voice, maybe imitation is going to be a little bit difficult. And imitation after it is a second building block really of learning after attention to people. And so then we, we move on to having kind of then this whole, I guess, unfolding um, of skills that you see that kind of, un, now I really have joint attention, I can initiate with someone, I can respond to this sharing a social um, interaction with a person to make a comment that is really purely social. I could request, I don't have to request for anything. I just want you to pay attention to the same thing I'm paying attention to and share that experience with me all the way to what we call symbolic or pretend play. And what you see in autism is really that there's a lack of that pretend play, that symbolic play after 18 months. And then you see the deficits in language, knowing that language is really symbolic in nature. So what we wanna make sure that we do is look beyond the kind of typical speech milestones and understand that there's a very great basis, again, for communication well before words come online and without a lot of practice of nonverbal social communication that's very coordinated and directed in nature, that a child is not gonna have enough practice with, with um, kind of communication and that back and forth interaction with another person to be able to have creative language acquisition truly come online and then to be used in, in a really effective manner. So that brings us to some important things to consider. We want to talk about speech versus language versus communication. And to truly work with a person with autism and understand communication with autism, we need to talk about all three. So speech and language development is a primary area of delay in early autism symptomology. Communication deficits are going to be persistent through um, autism spectrum disorders you know, throughout development. And then we absolutely need to have assessment being ongoing. But speech is so such a separate, I guess, um, uh, topic that, that often gets misunderstood or misconstrued or kind of overlapped and infused into language and communication. So just to kind of define or clarify for the purpose of today, with regards to speech, individuals with autism spectrum disorder absolutely have the ability to develop speech if they don't have some other type of speech issue that impacts their ability to produce kind of speech from either um, a kind of a motor planning standpoint or a, a speech center of the brain type of standpoint where I can't articulate the sounds correctly to have them be intelligible. But when we're talking about speech, we're really talking about how sounds are produced the fluency of your speech, so whether or not maybe you would have a stutter or be disfluent, that your words kind of are broken up, you can't get your words out clearly and in a fluent fashion. And then your voice would be kind of, and your voice quality, if you will, would be put into the speech category. The only caveat or disclaimer I'll say to voice is that many uh, students with autism spectrum disorder often have um, some what we call prosody or sing-song type of uh, tones to their speech. So someone may say, oh, their voice, they, they're speaking like, let's say, a character, or their voice is really high right now, or their voice is really low. That could actually be a social communication deficit and not related to something kind of physical in their, in their throat, if you will, with their vocal folds and their larynx that is making them have a hard time producing speech or voice in a manner which it maybe is too deep or too high or raspy. So when we're talking about a voice-based issue within the confines of the umbrella of speech, we're really talking about something that physically in your kind of speech center of your, of your body is impacting the ability for that sound to be produced in a manner which your voice sounds kind of clear and and um, intelligible to others. Okay, so from a communication standpoint, now that we have that cleared up, communication is significantly affected and 
as autism really is a social communication disorder. Therefore, as we just learned, learning and having language is something that kids with autism are probably going to be able to learn very, very nicely. We can teach a child with autism a lot of language skills to understand language and to, to produce language. But to use that language in social contexts to follow all those rules that really make a difference in really establishing, maintaining relationships with people is what really starts to fall into that area of communication. And that result, having your, your use of language and your understanding of language come together to equate to social success is what our, our individuals with autism spectrum disorder end up having a difficult time with. So we are going to focus now on communication and really go through what is communication in depth. This is really the exchange of information and ideas between two or more people, the message, the, the message sender and the message receiver, okay? And in general, the message sender must determine exactly what information or idea he or she would like to exchange and send this information to the message receiver, who must then really make sense of that and then act on language. So you say something to me, I have to listen to, understand, and act on your language and respond to that to have that back and forth two-way street to have communication truly begin to take place. So it's truly the purpose and function of language. And what I think my experience is, is that when we're working with individuals on the spectrum, you kind of, this little cartoon here, you have this duck and you have this man and he's asking him if he speaks this different language and the duck isn't responding and the duck isn't responding. Does he speak French? And then finally the man says, oh wait, quack. And the duck starts responding, quack, quack, and they start to find common ground and speak the same language so that they can have communication. That duck had his own language. This man had his own language, but together they weren't being able to communicate. So just to kind of bring that point home that as much language as we teach, if we're not teaching the language to, to be able to be used for communicative purposes, then you know our students with autism are going to have a wonderful set of language skills but not necessarily have them be meaningful and useful in their everyday experiences so the components of communication is that really their communication is obviously more than words we've, we've, we've definitely talked about that it's really the combination of your receptive language your understanding your expressive language and your pragmatic skills so expressive being you know, your verbal language, your gestural language, your facial expressions, maybe how your augmentative and alternative um, language, well, we'll get into a little bit further on in the talk, and how you're combining your understanding and use of language within the social context. So you really need multiple components to truly have enough skill sets and a foundation for, for communication to be, I guess, competent and, and, and effective. So now we're going to talk a little bit about language and we're going to break down expressive language, receptive language, and I'm going to tell you a story that I think is going to make all the difference in the world. And it really did for me, even after years of, of practice. So expressive language, the symbolic system used to convey one's thoughts, attitudes, emotions, and needs. And really expressive language is, has a consistent it's consistent, has rules, it's regulated, it's a coded system. It's everything that really comes out, your output, if you will, where your receptive language is the understanding, the processing and understanding of all of those, the verbal language, the oral speech, the signs, the gestures, the written pictures, the symbols that someone puts out, my ability to understand those units of information. And in students with autism, receptive language skills actually may be much more impaired than that of their expressive language skills. So this is where sometimes when we have more verbal students, we, we seem to either be um, tricked, if you will, or we start, to, we start to maybe misunderstand autism in a very different way. Because if a child can say, let's say, I'm sorry, does that child actually understand what I'm sorry means? Or is that, has that child just learned to place that perfectly, you know, perfect set of words that they've heard before in a, in a perfect place that fits that setting and they've learned and we'll talk about in this kind of chunked gestalt like set of, I, I know that this goes here, this is what fits here, so I'm gonna use this here. 
but does that child actually understand the words within that set or the meaning behind that? And so you hear, I'm sorry. Well, he can say, I'm sorry, he must know better. And then you realize, oh my gosh, he just or she just had this, let's say, behavior again. Well, why is that? Or they can they can write everything and they can say everything. And I'm having this conversation and I feel like this individual has all these beautiful language skills, but then I'm realizing something happens and I realize, hmm, you know what? I don't know that those are their generative words. Those are their ideas or those are borrowed. And when they're borrowed and they're not broken down to where I understand all the units of information, I may have false expectations on what that individual can do and can understand. So my teaching may be up here, but the child may not necessarily be able to learn what I'm teaching because I'm teaching way too high for where their understanding is. And then we may have behaviors. So thinking about the different situations that come into play, and we're gonna definitely talk about the relationship between communication and behavior, we just wanna keep that in mind that it is a common profile to have greater expressive language skills than receptive. I also think that the way in which individuals with autism interpret language is, is, is unique, and it needs a lot of understanding from a communication partner standpoint for, for us to be able to, I guess, help an individual navigate and us to communicate again in the same language versus in the cartoon you saw before where the man was trying many different ways and it just wasn't a good fit. So you can see that there's a picture of a flower in front of you and the word vase is written below it. Um, uh, a very good friend of mine, he, uh, he has autism and his mom had to go in and check in with his teacher on how he was doing. He's about 10 years old and he I would say is moderately verbal. He can speak in phrase to sentence speech when he needs to. But oftentimes he's more of your observer, if you will. And so um, he likes schedules, he likes predictability, and his mom had not prepped him for the fact that she was going to come into the class, that he wasn't gonna go on his regular routine to go up to the car and, and leave and go home for his therapy or you know his community outing. And so when he came into the when she came into the classroom, he was a little bit taken aback and he kept on saying, want to go home, want to go home, want to go home repetitively. And so his mom said, OK, what can I do to keep him engaged while I'm talking? I need to speak to the teacher. I, I didn't tell him I understand. I can't always I can't always prepare everything in advance. So she said he loves to draw. Um, he absolutely loves to draw. He actually sees the world, I believe. And, and so does his mom and kind of pictures, letters, numbers, sound, music, water, if, if that makes any sense. He, he doesn't necessarily see the world in the most conventional way like you and I may see it, but it, his way makes sense to him. So she said, go ahead um, and draw, draw on the board, draw a picture of a flower on the board. Okay, so that's very important. Draw a picture of a flower on the board. And he did just that. And he draws so quickly because he's so smart that it took about two seconds and he wanted to repetitively go home again. So she said, okay, put it in a vase. And he, in his mind, because he sees letters first, he wrote vase, V-A-S-E. So that is a flower in a vase. And his mom and his teacher stopped dead in their tracks and they said, oh my gosh, I just realized in that moment how what I say and how I say it makes a difference to such a degree in how, you know, you know, her son really understands her language. So if she were to say, draw the flower and put it, draw a picture of a flower and put it in a picture of a vase, draw a picture of a vase versus the word vase, that would have been clear and concrete. That would have been understandable. But say, put it in a vase, what, what that means to, to this boy and maybe another person with autism is very different than what that may have meant to me or that may have meant to you. So when a child is possibly having communication deficits or you're having, the child is struggling or the individual struggling with their learning, we may wanna take a look at how we are actually communicating and the messages that we're sending. And are they a match? Are they actually a language in which that person with autism can understand? Is it understandable to, to their ability to process the way in which they learn and process information? Pragmatic language is the use of language within social context. Again, the ways in which we send language to others, whether it be through speech, sign, 
gestures, written words, pictures or other printed symbols, facial expressions tell so much. If your face has, you know, just this look on it, like mine is right now, if I'm like, that's going to send a very clear message to somebody that maybe I'm not a big fan of something versus if I'm smiling and happy or if you sit forward versus if you sit back with your arms, every body kind of expression and positioning is going to send a different message. So you could say, I'm so happy. But if you say, yeah, I'm happy, that's not actually telling somebody something. The difficulty with autism is not only is this a skill that's very abstract and social and hard to learn, but it's hard to pay attention to and interpret. So if the teacher has a, a negative tone, let's say, in her voice or in his voice, is that, and the child is not responding, is it because I don't even know that that's something to pay attention to, that that is relevant? Maybe I'm just paying attention to the language without kind of the social nuances that surround it, the noise that really holds it together to send a message one way or another. So thinking about, again, how we send language and how we send messages and then how we're teaching those, the, our children to be able to truly um, send a message that, that is social in nature and not just language or scripted words that don't necessarily make a difference. We wanna really focus on that autism is a social learning disability, it's a social communication disorder. So we need to make sure that we're teaching social communication at the core of the target kind of goals and objectives we have and the skills for our children. So why do we communicate? We communicate for a couple different reasons. Regardless of autism, we all have these kind of same sets of reasons that we communicate to express our wants and needs, to share information in order to be really seen as an individual, to develop kind of social closeness or in order to maintain relationships with people, and to conform really to social conventions in order to be accepted. So we communicate to get something or to get rid of something. We communicate to share an experience. We communicate just to have someone pay attention to us for social purposes and, and to really fit in. And this communication, again, starts really in the first three months of life. And it just continues to kind of um, has a cascading effect that really builds a child and prepares them to follow this social developmental tra trajectory versus that of more of a becoming an expert of the physical world. Joint attention is um, this kind of sharing of one's experience and observing an object or an event by really using this eye gaze and, and pointing of gestures. It's, it's critical for social development, language acquisition, and cognitive development later on. And it's, it's really a, an individual's way of pointing out something for purely social reasons, for the purpose of sharing. It's not a requesting behavior. Oftentimes, once two people are in the same kind of shared moment, there could be a request that, that gets layered on top of that. But the actual act of joint attention is to respond to something for social purposes or to initiate something for social purposes. This, again, is a pivotal skill in having language acquisition and cognitive development continue to grow, and it's a core deficit in autism. So it should be at kind of the front line of our focus when we're thinking about intervention for individuals with autism, as this is going to make a difference in relationship and perspective taking skills for the rest of their lives. We can communicate through conventional means, such as verbal language, like using speech, Nonverbal, our gestures, our signs, what, what we call augmentative and alternative communication. So for those individuals that don't have the ability to develop speech that's functional, that can be used as a primary mode of communication, then we may use a picture-based system or a device that actually, when you press something, has a voice output. We also may use a combination of these, um, these conventional communicative kind of means, we call them. Many, many people also, regardless of autism, communicate through non-conventional means, through behaviors, or what we call variable communication behaviors, such as crying. And so we want to understand that every behavior sends a message, whether it be conventional or um, non-conventional, and that we want to make sure that we're really becoming interpreters of our individuals with autism's communication, even if it seems primitive, even if it seems unconventional, even if it seems like you want to give them more, give that person more skills 
we want to make sure that we don't we don't, I guess, uh, take for granted even the subtle communicative acts, whether it be the slight look away. That may mean that there's a problem coming. I'm telling you just by looking slightly away that maybe I'm not interested in that. If I have the skills, maybe I'll combine some of my communication acts so I can send my message and it's more clear to you. But if I don't have the skills yet, anything I do, whether I lean forward, I lean back, I push something away, we want to consider and then use that as a, a baseline, if you will, or a platform to teach from um, so that we can start building more conventional communication skills into that individual's repertoire. When we, when we talk about autism, when we talk about communication, there's so many misunderstandings and myths. I just thought that we take a moment to maybe debunk the myths. So in understanding communication, many people, and these are all true, true, true um, examples are not made up, say that individuals that are nonverbal don't understand and then don't communicate. And that is absolutely false. Actually, many of the individuals I know and what the research show is, is that many people that are nonverbal understand more than those that are actually verbal. They don't have that kind of component of the expressive language being higher than the receptive. So the because expressive is so difficult, the, the re receptive language has the ability to grow. Individuals who have verbal language always understand and communicate. No, we have, we've already discussed that. We know that people with autism oftentimes learn in these very kind of, they learn from it, they get a chunk of information. It's almost like a piece of a puzzle and they have the ability, this really unique talent to put this set of language as a chunk, as a unit, a whole, into a perfect place where it appears as though they understand, but possibly they don't know what makes up the unit of that that information, and that's called gestalt learning. Individuals who have verbal language always can use language for social purposes. I think that many of us have probably met people that don't have um, autism that know that just because you can use verbal language doesn't mean that you have social etiquette and that you can use your language in a socially productive way. But people with autism, if we don't teach them social, then they are not necessarily going to innately learn social on their own. And, and when we have to remember when people with autism do learn social skills and social language, that it is it can be very fatiguing. And this comes from people with autism. I, I have a couple friends that have autism that had did a, done a panel for me in a graduate level class. And having to communicate socially back and forth, answering and asking questions and you know engaging in a panel like discussion they would take off of work for the next two days because that was so difficult. That would, took so much work. Imagine having to lift weights that were too heavy for you all day long. And then you think, okay, people with autism are processing language that is really social and symbolic in nature and probably a part of their brain that is really supposed to only process intellectual or kind of what we call non-biological, non-social items. And then being social is, is so difficult, it could be fatiguing. And then you look at how well our kids are doing in school and how many things that a person with autism has to sit in a class and filter in and filter out and get through the day with a whole bunch of people that are constantly moving and social is ever changing. And wow, I, I don't know how a person with autism actually does it. So I guess shifting our paradigm of thinking to that Communication is so difficult for autism, for people with autism, but there's so many reasons why. And then to, to see how, how nicely a person with autism can learn when we match our teaching style to their learning needs it is really um, just shows the brilliance in, in every person with autism, regardless of cognitive ability. And that leads me to individuals who are nonverbal and, and have a low who have are nonverbal mean they have low intelligence levels. And we know that that's absolutely not true. We actually know that intellect is very separate um, and, and, and independent of a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. So let's talk about some of these, some of these specific reasons why students with autism have difficulty communicating. We have children with autism do typically have, didn't necessarily get the skills um, that maybe a child that wasn't gone, didn't go on, excuse me, to be later diagnosed with autism, they didn't have those skills develop um, to assist in the acquisition of communication skills. Maybe they weren't paying attention to what we consider, I guess, if you will, the right things in the first years of their first year or two of their life. So maybe they weren't 
paying attention to what mom was doing and then what she was doing it with and having this kind of foundation for what we call subject verb agreement. So here's the person, here's the action, here's the object they're doing this with to create that language structure needed to be able to have really creative language acquisition come online. Maybe they weren't paying attention to all the nonverbal social kind of gestures and coordinated communication acts that mom or caregivers in the first year of life were constantly doing because their focus was kind of what we call neurologically or their brain shifted their focus to the things that were really making their brain excited. And if paying attention to faces were not making their brain excited for people, but the toy on the floor that lit up, well, I'm gonna wanna pay attention to that too. We know with regardless of any disability, just people in general don't do things for long periods of time that their brain is not and their body's not really rewarded and motivated to do. That's where the whole concept of reinforcement comes into play. So ability to maintain attention, to shift attention back and forth, the ability to really take the perspective of others, to, to pay attention to someone, to realize they're, they have a different perspective than I do. And if I want them to share this with me, I need to find that common ground. Becoming the over-selective attention, ability to use new experiences to relate to previous experiences. That is a very difficult skill that takes a lot of paying attention to people and being an observational learner of people to, to develop. The ability to process you know, auditory stimuli efficiently and in a time frame that you don't, you're not still processing the first part of, of language so that you miss the rest of the message and someone's on to the next thing before I've even got the first part kind of processed and understood. And processing of language and autism is innately slower so that that we will talk about different ways that we can support and supplement to enhance processing naturally so that that person with autism doesn't always have to feel like they're one step behind. The ability to think abstractly. Again, this word reciprocity keeps on popping up and that's really this very social volley, this back and forth interaction that really gives a foundation for staying socially connected and the brain to be very actively engaged so that you can teach these great communication and language skills. Um, in, in a manner that is um, social in nature. And then kind of just moving forward, the understanding of communicative intent and the ability again to imitate because imitation is one of those beginning, as I said before, building blocks of learning. So now we have my friend Bart and he is not happy and he is sending a very cl clear message through behavior. So if this picture doesn't kind of solidify the fact that behavior is communication and communication is behavior in all sense of the word, I don't know what does. To, to give a, a shout out to a friend of mine, this picture was actually drawn by a young woman with autism who saw a cartoon-based character in one of my talks um, a while back and said, that she feels like she can draw all the Simpson characters uh, much better than the actual artist. And she got it from a dinner table and got a red pencil, a blue pencil, a yellow pencil, and a regular pencil. And she drew this picture in about 10 seconds. And she said, will you please use this one in your next talk? So um, I find this to be the most amazing thing because it was actually done by a person with autism. And she drew it after sitting in a talk of mine and, and realizing that not only does she, probably is she correct that she's a, an amazing artist, but that this was how she kind of saw this concept of behaviors communication. And I think with most people, but especially in autism, when I don't have the, the language skills to be able to communicate with, and then I don't have the social understanding of how to use that language in, in context in a fluid kind of, you know, ever-changing manner, I'm probably going to get frustrated. I'm probably going to do something that's less conventional or behavioral in nature to send that a message across because what many of our children learn is that behavior gets a really fast response. So I get a lot of attention and I either get out of what I don't want to do, I get what I want to do, or something works a lot faster when the behavior at first comes out of nowhere. So what we have to remember is how do we respond to that and when do we push in language and communication? How do we have prevention for this? And when the behavior does occur, what is the best response? And that really is something that I think you'll uh, be able to get a lot of great information when, if you, uh, if you 
register for our behavior basics training that will be coming up um, in the next month. So we understand that there is um, lots of differences with language development and communication development in autism than maybe there is in children that are not later on diagnosed with autism. And we understand that behavior is communication and communication is behavior. We also understand that there is a clear difference between speech and language and communication and that how we communicate is just as important in our teaching of people with autism as it is what we're teaching. We know that there's true functions or reasons for communication and we know that there's many different means or ways in which we communicate and we really need those to be coordinated and have a social kind of flair, if you will, to, to send a message that's meaningful and to be kind of ha have the foundational skills to later become kind of a socially competent, emotionally competent communicator. So how do we get there? We, we have interventions that enha to enhance communication functioning and the steps involved in assessment and intervention for communication deficits really begin with evaluating an individual's current set of skills and, and forms of communication. We always want to look at what can the student with, with autism or what can the person do and then what are the next steps. If we're always looking at what can't they do, we're going to be working from an area of deficit versus an area of strength. And that's going to be a much slower route and it's not necessarily going to be enjoyable for, for either you as the interventionist or teacher or educator or that individual. We're going to be fighting the power, if you will. So we determine the communicative functions function of the, you know, let's say non-conventional behavior. And we assess also the student's symbolic loving level of understanding. And with this, we really want to think about how much does that child understand? What language does that individual have? But what communicative stage is that individual truly communicating on? And how are they coping when their language or their highest level of communication drops? What type of behaviors are you seeing? So if you're seeing an individual that has language, a lot of language, maybe can talk about every type of car in the world or every state or every president, but the minute that something goes wrong, maybe the child is having tantrums that you know, um, are, are very, very using behavioral strategies to truly cope then possibly that language is not indicative of, of a communicative stage that's conversational in nature. Or even that language may not be kind of social language, it may be scripts, it may be things that are very stimulating and, and make that individual feel good, but it may not, I guess, get to the point where the student can cope in the, in the, in the event maybe that he or she gets stressed. Um, so we want to make sure we assess all of those items. We want to observe how the student communicates. How are they greeting? How are they requesting for food? How are they really letting you know they want something or don't want something? Do they even understand the concept of that help is something I can request for? Has that intention come online? The idea that help is, an, is something I can actually ask for and that you are a source of assistance or that you are a source of engagement for me. The affirmation negation, yes or no, how is the student letting you know this? How is he or she getting attention from another person? Is it by touching, pulling, or having a behavior? Or have they, have the, has a student learned to call someone's name to gain attention? What about communicating about physical states? Emotional expression is so abstract, and it's, it's something we often seem to wait to teach, but it's one of the things that makes a difference in, in many people's lives early, early on. So if you can't express that you're hurt or that you're sick or that you don't like something or you like something, then someone may not know to and may continue to put you through something that any other child, let's say, that had the language would automatically have said no. And you probably would have said, OK, well, you have to do three more of this or or OK, no worries. Or what can I do to change this? Our children with autism don't always get that advantage to be able to learn the language that they would need to to talk about their feelings or emotional states or physical states. And so we just kind of assume that power for them. So just because we haven't gotten through all of our requests, if you will, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be teaching, again, communication and language in a manner where it intersects versus is always one step at a time. Humor is something that we need to teach a person with autism and we need and we need to also assess how much do they understand of, of humor and, and what is their use of humor? Because this is where we could get into situations where someone could be making fun of them and it's not funny. It's more of a bullying situation. If I never taught humor, 
to understand or to use, or I don't have those skills yet, I have to think about when is this going to be important and when do I need to push this into my, um, I guess, intervention. And then finally, needing of information and sharing. How is that individual communicating those, those items? To do this, to, to target this, once we assess and we know where that individual is, we're going to create communication opportunities. And we're going to do this through communication temptations, language facilitation techniques, and active participation. And I'll break down each of those areas. Communication opportunities provide intrinsic motivation to allow the learner to initiate and lead an interaction. Communication temptations are really those um, structured situations that entice a variety of communication functions through gestures, body postures, vocalization, pictures, what we AAC or that augmentative and alternative communication and or words. And environmental arrangements are part of communication temptations, incidental teaching opportunities. So some examples are, let's say for a young child, you have bubbles, but they're in a closed clear jar and it's closed tight. If a child wants bubbles, you can give them the bubbles in the closed jar. The, the bubbles are here. They can get the clear big jar of bubbles. Now you just have another opportunity that that child is going to need your assistance to be able to possibly open the top of the bubble, the, the clear jar, to get the bubbles out. Then maybe you have another opportunity, if it's stuck, to talk about, oh, I need help. Think about how many opportunities you can push in to increase the practice, the repetition that a person with autism needs to learn a skill before you actually blow the, the bubbles. Okay, the same thing about cookies in a clear jar. If you have a wind-up toy, and maybe the child doesn't have the fine motor skills yet to wind that up and it turns off, how do I get it to start again? Possibly putting your hands in something that maybe you're not used to the sensation, all the language and communication because of the unexpected um, experience. A car rolling off a table, possibly a puzzle that has the last one or two pieces left out and I need to complete something that makes me feel good. So now I have a reason to have to communicate. So all these temptations are truly just inserting high motivating reasons to communicate multiple times within an activity or an event to make sure we get the practice because we know with communication practice makes perfect and a child actually needs to have two nonverbal communicative acts that they initiate a minute to have someone respond to to get enough practice to have creative language acquisition have the ability to come online so if we're only giving one opportunity here one opportunity there, and then we're questioning, well, we're making a statement that the individual with autism isn't learning or we're not seeing the progress we want, this is too difficult. Is it because we didn't insert enough temptations within enough opportunities to get enough practice to have the child initiate, to have us respond, for that child to be able to have the, the foundation or the platform to learn the skills? So we always wanna, again, look back at our teaching. And so we use these language facilitation techniques to help support us in our teaching. They're designed to facilitate spontaneous language and communication. They're paired with communication temptations. And so they involve everything from kind of waiting and thinking about how long do I need to wait for for this individual versus the next. I will tell you that when you think that it's long enough, it's probably just short of that. It may feel like a lifetime for you, but it may be only maybe three quarters of half the time of a person needing to process the information. We kind of have a clinical rule that we count kind of to five one thousands or five elephants. Maybe we'll tell some young parents. And if that's not enough, then you wait some more. But you're waiting with this expectant wait that has a signal that supports that you're really anticipating that your child or that child is going to do something in return. Modeling is a, is a skill. Repetition, as I just spoke about. We like to say following the lead, but in actuality, it's not following the lead of a person with autism. It's following their focus of attention. Talking about what they're looking at and thinking about is going to have that individual be able to be socially connected, redirect their attention back to you so that you have a, a, the ability to establish a shared kind of agenda that, that is similar with that person and be on the same page so you can have a platform to get back and forth interactions going to be able to teach. We want to balance our questions with comments. If you have an individual still learning language and you ask a question that that individual cannot answer, that's not really fair. It's just another demand that may prompt a behavior. 
if you balance questions and comments, you're actually giving an experience that's very similar to a conversation that that individual may have to have later on. When we're, when we're talking about questions also, if, there's, if you're not actually looking for an answer, it's absolutely okay to not ask a question. It's not just, it feels polite, I think, to us to ask questions. Are you ready to work is a perfect one. What if the child says no? There was an option there. It's actually much more clear and, and respectful to be just concrete and simple in your language and make a statement. It's time to work. First, we're going to do this. Then we're going to do that. That makes sense to a person with autism. That tells you that, that tells them you're actually trying to speak their same language. Positive reinforcement that's really tied back contextually to what you're working with so that the activity and the interaction with you as a person becomes reinforcing. Use of commenting, expanding, uh, plus one is what we really talk about. So if a child uses a, um, makes a comment or, or has a word or has a gesture, you always add one step above that for your model and expand so that that child is exposed to the next level of skill that you're gonna want them to work towards. It's not just brand new right away. And then scaffolding is that teaching uh, one skill from another learned skill. Active participation refers to providing many opportunities to allow a learner to, to be communicating actively in an activity. And it really may even have the student have productive roles so that they have to communicate and participate in everything from setting up a table for a snack or an art project to really participating actively in an academic task. So to kind of close out today, We'll talk about visual aids and augmentative communication briefly. And these are really just supplements that are going to help enhance communication. They are everything from like your choice board of which, which do you want to do today to a first then giving a person an understanding that math may not be preferred, but computers coming next. So you don't have to wonder what I'm thinking. You don't have to guess and try to predict my actions or my thoughts. I'm going to give that, that, that information to you. And information is power. It's also very regulating and calming. So it's going to keep me in an available to learn state. Our self-help boards and our schedules are really going to help organize and, and, and help us plan through activities and not have to store everything in our brain all at once. And then activity boards are going to give us these specific this is, this is the specific communication vocabulary that I need to kind of get through an activity and be maybe social with a friend during the day. And so augmentative and alternative communication is really um, when we, which needs a lot more research, but it's really when I don't possibly have enough speech to use it language, verbal language as a primary mode of communication, Possibly, I need something to help supplement or augment my ability to communicate. And so this is where we come into um, systems like the picture exchange communication system or sign language or these devices that you'll see in just a moment. We use augmentative and alternative communication because it reduces frustration. It makes communicating easy and therefore reduces problem behaviors. It can be used to teach functional communication skills. Again, repetitively, it then prevents problem behavior. It provides more, again, you heard that word, opportunities for participation, so practice of communication to build language skills. It produces positive effect on others' behavior. So if a student in a class sees that their friend with autism is able to communicate with them independently and successfully, they're probably gonna wanna spend more time with them. They're gonna have a different level of respect for that person they're gonna start engaging. It's gonna to start to make more sense. So you're gonna build some social relationships. It definitely can improve an individual's understanding of others' communication. And, and, and again, the, the benefit, the positive benefit on the social um, and language development, ju just by how um, you affect the environment by giving someone a voice, giving someone the words that they probably have stored but maybe don't know how to organize them in a fashion that they can get them out in a manner that are understandable to others. So we either use unaided, these are things that don't require any equipment because these are kind of like gestures, pantomimes or signs or aided communication, all of your communication books and pictures that we see like in our picture exchange communication systems or our voice output devices. And this is just a little um, note on PECS. If, if you're not familiar with PECS, PECS is a system that has six phases. It's, it's a based in applied behavior analysis. It teaches functional communication with a social exchange piece to it. 
and the the three picture series that you'll see are a little boy really going through that he's gotten to all through all six phases and he's got a nice repertoire of vocabulary he gets he has his thought he finds his words he creates his phrase and he comes to his communication partner and they have this beautiful gaze to face social interaction this is truly joint attention they're both here in the second picture focused on the same thing at the same time and then she's responding to him in kind and this is then making communicating with people using language in social context very rewarding and now this is something this little boy is going to want to do again and again and again there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to every augmentative communication system whether it's because it's portable and not but not always available or or it's too it's too bulky and it takes too much prep time in the beginning and um or it's available but maybe it's too complex of a technology-based system to use so pex is something that has a lot of advantage to it it has some limited uh, limitations but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily require you to have motor skills and it doesn't necessarily um require that uh, you have to um, you have to be able to have a lot of cognitive ability at the beginning to learn it because the, the phases are very systematic in nature. What it does though is require that social interaction always happens within every exchange. So it really does target some of the core deficits in autism, and it's a really great starting place for for individuals still learning language that don't yet have communication as um, a primary mode of uh, a verbal language is a primary mode of communication so um, this is just a bit on electronic devices and for the purpose of time i would like to just kind of show you where we're getting into more electronic devices so things that you're putting a battery in and here you have functional communication where a switch where you're really putting a picture on and you're sending one message to either request something or to comment on something. So this, you press it, you record your voice into it, you press it and it speaks for you. But the power that this gives an individual with autism that doesn't have the verbal language or the skill sets yet to do this just by using verbal speech and having someone in a room know that they are hungry or that this tastes good and they're yummy, it is, is really, it's a gift. It, it, it can change the entire landscape of that child's ability to engage in social interaction in a classroom. And then as a child progresses, if, communi so if AAC and, and augmentative communication type of strategies and supports are still necessary, there's different types of devices that can clearly grow to set up everything from stories to support activities. So principles to remember. Communication needs to occur throughout an individual's entire world. It's not something that's taught in an isolated set of, as an isolated set of skills in one setting for 30 minutes a day or 30 minutes twice a week. We want to teach across settings, people, and activities, and we really want communication to, to be taught um, really uh, as, as an experience. We want, we want have many opportunities. We want to do this and in a way that's very meaningful and, and efficient, not, not to know that, we wanna know that communication is not a race. We can slow down, we can wait, we can visually support and show. Active participation is essential during social interactions and predictable activities. Visual supports and AAC support communication development and communication learning will often be through doing first and then understanding. And um, I, I just have to highlight that Robin Parker, this really fantastic mentor and speech language pathologist that was a large part of my training in my life, came up with many of these principles to remember. So these are kind of a, a take home that I can give to you so that when we get caught up in the day-to-day -day rigmarole of teaching and understanding autism and communication, we can stop, we can sit back, we can think, what am I saying? What am I doing? What does this individual I'm working with need to learn? And what are my next steps per that individual's strengths that are gonna make that, that person with autism really be a socially successful communicator? So I think that um, I, I'm happy to take questions. I know that we're at time right now, but to, to close, if we do all these things and remember these principles, we'll have a very happy Bart Simpson. And my friend will be able to understand that draw a picture and put it in a vase means this, it looks just like this, and then we'll be able to be speaking the same language and not necessarily have to be the man 
talking to the doc that's constantly struggling back and forth to find kind of that match of instructional strategy or the common fit. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? You can um, let me know if you have a question by writing in the chat box. And if you would like permission for the microphone, I'm happy to, to give uh, participants the microphone. Okay, so if nobody has any questions, I want to thank you again for spending the time with me today. Oh, Vicki, someone's typing. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Marlene's amazing. <laughs> just oh i know shawnee thank you for letting me know um i know my phone keeps on ringing i apologize um marlene is the name i logged under for our account but it's me but i'll, I'll be happy to be here any day do you guys have any other questions Okay, well, I hope everybody has a great rest of their day, and I would definitely log on to um, see the uh, behavior basics training that's coming up on our kind of webinars that we're just kicking off at the Els for Autism Foundation. So thank you so much again, and have a great evening. I'm going to go ahead and um, sign off now.